Hello everybody and um, thank you so much for joining me just while you're all signing in. Hello, thank you for some starting to join me. I'm Vanessa. Lovely to have you over here. We'll just wait a little bit until you guys are coming in thick and fast. It's great to have you here and congratulations because I guess if you're here it means you've got your baby on your way or you might have your new little baby very near you or on you and congratulations. It's an amazing time. It's a tough time um, and a challenging one but my god it's amazing as well isn't it. So fab you're all coming in. So I shall start by telling you a little bit about me. So I'm Vanessa Christie and I'm a lactation consultant and I am also the author of, I shall show you, The Baby Feeding Book, which came out in February of this year. And it's a book all about breastfeeding, bottle feeding and starting solid food. So I have now um, just over 20 years experience shows how old I am, um, of working with new families, breastfeeding families. I've worked with over 10,000 families now about um, all things to do with breastfeeding and the pre and postnatal period. Um, and I also have three babies of my own, which are currently banished out there in the garden somewhere. So hopefully they're not going to disturb us. My youngest is just eight months old now and I'm still breastfeeding her. And uh, I thought about maybe she might need a feed during this, but actually she's just had a feed, so I don't think that's gonna happen, not today. Um, so let's get on with what we're gonna talk about. Now, it's, it's always hard when you've just got half an hour, there's so much to chat about to do with breastfeeding. So I wanted to kind of pick out the key things that are gonna be centrally useful to you guys. So it's always a good place to start with the baby themselves and what babies can actually do and when they're born, what skills they have and how we can help them to use those skills to make sure that breastfeeding is as straightforward as it possibly can be uh, for them and for us. Because if breastfeeding was always a complete walk in the park, then to be honest, I, I wouldn't really have a huge amount of a job when it comes to breastfeeding. Um, but it's really, really true that actually when we have a few things in place, breastfeeding can be a lot more, a lot um, kind of smoother than we think it possibly can be. So when we hear about friends and family maybe getting really sore cracked nipples or babies not wanting to latch on or all of that kind of stuff, um, so many, so many things actually can be prevented in the first place and actually when we know what to do then they can also be sorted out really quickly so they don't need to spiral into a great big issue. Um, so, so we're going to talk about how we can help babies do what they're already born knowing how to do and we're going to talk about finding a great position and what partners and others can do to be involved as well and also how, um, how you can look after yourself as a breastfeeding mum and why that's really important. So let's get going first of all with the baby themselves. So when babies are born, we, well, as human beings, we effectively have kind of crudely three, three parts of our brain. So right at the back of our brain, we've got um, what's often termed the reptilian part of our brain. So that's where everything happens automatically. So we've got our blood pressure, our temperature control, our heart rate, our breathing rate, all that kind of stuff. When a baby is born and they're healthy and all that stuff is happening, they don't obviously have to do anything to make that happen. It's just there. So that's the reptilian part of their brain. Now the frontal lobe, the front part of our brain is often referred to as our human brain. And that's where we do all our complex thought, all our problem solving, um, all our kind of regulating our hormones, our emotions, sorry. Um, so if we're kind of feeling really cross or anxious about something, we can have, have this little talk to ourselves and calm ourselves down. So babies have that frontal part of their lobe, um, their brain, but it's not talking it's not making those kind of connections. So babies really can't do that self-regulation and figure out all those things that we can do, those complex human processes for themselves. So what babies are working in is what's called the midbrain, their mammalian brain. So essentially instinct. So if you're thinking like a little lamb or a kitten or a foal or something like that, they are working purely on their basis, right? Am I hungry? Am I safe? Am I loved? Am I warm? 
that kind of thing. Um, it's just, it's instinct. And newborn babies are working in a very similar part of their brain. So they're not kind of thinking, um, you know, I, I need to go and get some, get some food. They're thinking, well, I'm here and I'm just going to make my little cues that they can make. And we'll talk about that in a moment. And I need somebody to respond to me to help me to get to what I need. So babies are um, born with reflexes, essentially, to help them meet these instinctual needs that they have. So one of the main things to do with feeding is this rooting reflex. So if they feel something on their cheek, they are going to turn to it. They're going to go ah like that and maybe stick their tongue out and do that, like smack their lips, try and get something in their mouth. And this is called rooting. And when we see that in a newborn baby, that means that they are in the mood for a, for a feed. So we want to forget about anything that says babies only need to be fed at certain times or at certain um, kind of frequency. So every three hours, every four hours, something like that. Actually, that doesn't fit in with the kind of biology of how we work as human babies. Babies just need to be fed instinctively according to when they need it. So when we're seeing these kinds of cues, this rooting, babies might start you know, doing a grasping reflex as well. So they touch us, they grasp us, and this kind of helps them find out where they want to be and feel comfortable next to our skin and they can smell us as well. And all of these things just help them figure out what they want to be doing. So they also have what's called a stepping reflex. So the baby, essentially, if they have something on their feet like this, then they can step, they can push themselves up. And this is a kind of primal instinct, this primal drive to help them get to where they need to be as well. And when they are close to us like this, then they can use their really strong sense of smell to smell the milk, to smell our skin, they can see the bullseye of where they need to get to. And I don't know if any of you guys have noticed, but when we're pregnant, often the areola, the darker bit around our nipple actually gets darker. And that is for this, this reason that babies see contrast and they can't see very far, but they can see about this distance, if you can see me, and they can see the difference between the dark and the light shade of the nipple. So they think, aha, that's where I need to get to. Um, they also have a, a very strong sense of taste. So it's thought that the amniotic fluid actually has a very similar kind of smell and taste to, to breast milk in order to when they're born and they're put on our skin, then it feels familiar. They can smell us. They can they don't basically kind of freak out too much because they're like, aha, uh -huh, I'm in a very safe warm place and they can hear our voices because I'm sure you know that when when you're pregnant and the baby's inside they can hear your voice sounds a bit like they're underwater um but but that's what they can hear so when they come out and they're on your skin and we're talking to them again they're like ah oh, I'm in a lovely calm safe place and all of these things put them in the mood to feed now, what we don't want to do is put babies under any pressure when it comes to breastfeeding, because what happens if we dress them all up, we put them somewhere completely different, and then we think, OK, we need to wait until you know, two o'clock for a feed time, because that's when somebody's told me that I need to feed my baby. And they might be lying over there in their little comfy Moses basket, kind of rooting around, going ah, and sucking on their blanket and waving their little arms essentially showing us that they're ready to feed, um, but we might not necessarily be picking up on it. So then 10 minutes later, they might start getting a bit more agitated and crying. And then we think, okay, time to feed her. So we bring her to us, we try and plonk her on. Now that doesn't tend to go too well very often because what's happened is that they're getting a little bit tired and fretty by that point. And also where they're missing out on that ability to use all those senses and their reflexes that they're born with. So what we can do is strip all of these things back a little bit. Keep our babies with us as often as we can. And I'm not saying you have to keep your baby on you 24 hours a day, that's not possible. But generally as often as we can, just enjoy these snuggles, strip the baby off skin to skin. So you just have your open chest with your baby um, without their clothes on like this as well, just in a nappy. You could maybe put a wrap around them so that you've got your hands free. 
Uh, you could have a dressing gown or a shirt around you to keep you warm. And in this way, you can, you can see very early on when they're showing us these cues of rooting and moving their little fists around and wriggling a bit. And they are in the position to then come calmly to the breast because they can already smell us and see us and all of, all of that kind of thing, which is very different for when we're picking up a baby who's already a bit stressed and dressed up, maybe swaddled, and then we're trying to get out a little bit of boob and pushing them on. And babies, when they're like that, especially if you can see the angle I'm at, if we're leaning forward and we're trying to kind of push our baby onto our breast like this, babies will often arch their back and push their head away like that and it can look like they're fighting to get away and that's a really horrible feeling for us as mums um, and also the babies start kind of getting a bit more stressed and because we are so connected with our babies we end up in this spiral together of getting more and more stressed we're feeding off each other's stress so what we can do to avoid that is lean back a little bit lean back a little bit so if you push your bottom forward a bit in your chair or on the bed or wherever you are and then lean back into it and bring our baby on top of us a bit like this which is completely different from sitting upright and leaning forwards and then when babies are on top of us they feel very very stable and secure on our bodies we can support them um, really calmly because our bodies are taking a lot of their weight we're not having to use the weight so much in our arms because when you've had a baby and you're tired and potentially you're anticipating that this feed is going to be maybe a bit hard or a bit painful or something like that without us even realizing we can put our shoulders up we can tense our arms we can tense our jaw like this and babies as i say are very kind of instinctive little things they're intuitive and they pick up on that so very very quickly we end up in this spiral of everybody getting a little bit ah but we can avoid it by leaning back they feel the comfort and the warmth of your body their whole body is supported on your body like this so nothing's hanging off because the other thing that can sometimes happen when you're sitting upright is that the baby's hips are sort of dangling off up there somewhere and they might be twisting over their shoulder to get to your breast kind of going ah like that which also can make them a little bit fretty. So in any position, we want to make sure that they're completely turned in towards you like this. So then we can have our arm nicely relaxed along the length of the baby like this. And we're looking at the whole of the baby's body being tucked in towards you nice and straight. So we're not having to do any of that twist like that. The other thing that you might notice is that nothing is behind this little babe's head because what we want the baby to be able to do is get their chin off their chest to, able, to be able to then open their mouth like that so that they can get a really big mouthful of breast in their mouth. Now, if we have a hand behind their head, what happens automatically is that we, without really realizing, even if it's just a gentle hand there, we're stopping the baby from being able to do this and so their chin tends to go down on their chest like this. And when, if you try it at home, you put your chin down on your chest like that and try and open up your mouth. It's really, really hard. So we want to be able, well, the babies to be able to open their mouth up nice and wide like that. Well, their head is going to be absolutely fine. Babies' heads are a bit wibbly wobbly. But when, they're, when you're leaning back a little bit and you're supporting them with your arm like this, um, then... I promise you their head is going to be absolutely fine. If you are going for a slightly different position and they are across you like that, then you can still lean back a little bit and you can support as the baby's coming on to the breast, you can have your hand in a sort of V shape like that behind their neck. So with your thumb on one ear and their finger on the other ear. And then what you do is you guide the baby towards you using the heel of your hand on their shoulders, on the, on the back of their shoulders. So again, we're avoiding doing any of this pressing with their head. So when a baby is coming into to the breast in this position here, so we wanna lean back, they're gonna be doing this a little bit with their head to trying to find the breast. We wanna line the baby up, and you might've heard this before, this term about nose to nipple. And this is when I've got a little breast here, this is when we're lining the baby up so that their nose is opposite your nipple like that. And you'll notice here 
that the baby's chin is the first thing that's touching the breast and that's what we want to see because when babies are in this kind of position the only way they're going to get that nipple into their mouth is by putting their chin up opening their mouth wide and then coming onto the breast like that okay if we line a baby up with their nip with your nipple sorry right opposite their mouth there's absolutely no incentive there for them to want to open their mouth up wide and people often say to me oh my baby just doesn't open their mouth up but then when we look at the baby yawning or crying we can see really clearly that the baby can open their mouth up they just need to have a reason to do it so when we're lining them up nose to nipple the only way that nipple is going to get into the baby's mouth is if they open their mouth up wide and sometimes there's just a split second moment where we're in this perfect position the baby's opening up and when they're like that if you are in a position where you're supporting their neck like this then we just hug the baby into our breast okay if you're more in this position like like this maybe with the baby over your opposite leg and you sit back a little bit over the opposite leg like this or on the same leg like that then you can just guide the baby towards you using your forearm just a little hug in and you might actually even not have to do that because if you're leaning back a little bit and the baby can use this really strong muscle they have uh, that they're born with on the back of their neck to bob themselves onto the breast themselves you might not even really have to do anything and you're just suddenly taken by surprise you're like oh they're actually there um so it really depends on your size your shape your breast size how the baby is and all of that kind of thing as to how this really works individually for you but it's definitely worth experimenting and playing a little bit around with if you're if you're in this position it definitely helps to have a cushion under your arm here i'm just going to grab one quickly so i can show you so if we have a cushion under your arm like that then you can really relax your shoulders down because what can sometimes happen without us realizing is that we're kind of doing this a little bit and you're sat there like that and then that can get really really painful and you end up getting quite sore across the back of your neck which is really avoidable so that brings me on to thinking about you and yourself and how calm our minds and our bodies are because what we really want to aim for when we're breastfeeding is that we're feeling as calm and connected with our babies as we possibly can because the main hormone that's involved in releasing milk from our breasts is called oxytocin and oxytocin is that hormone that we often talk about in labour that gets the contractions going and stuff and it's the same hormone that actually releases the milk from our breast in what's called this letdown reflex. Now when we're feeling stressed and uptight, maybe anticipating that things are going to be painful and that kind of thing, it can actually put the hormonal blockers up on being able to let that milk flow. So what we want is to try and feel as calm as we possibly can to get the breastfeeding going and then once the milk is flowing then we're in this lovely cycle of that actually helps to produce more oxytocin and when you start feeding sometimes we can feel this amazing kind of sense of relaxation as this oxytocin is kind of just flooding out of our brain and it really is honestly a really lovely feeling so what we can do is first of all think about our own body as i was saying so we don't want to have our shoulders up like this if we do a really quick body scan so if you start from the top of your head and you work all the way down your body and just think about releasing any tension that you find. So starting here through your face, relaxing your jaw, relaxing your shoulders down, relaxing your tummy and your arms, your bum if you're all clenched up, your legs, even all the way down to your toes. And then it's incredible how that automatically can just help release some tension and calm us down. Taking some lovely purposeful breaths breathing in and then breathing out for slightly longer if you do at least three purposeful breaths like that that really helps as well calm us down and look at your baby too do a little body scan of them so start at their head look at their little ears their little nose all their little features their fingernails baby's fingers are mm, amazing um so all the way down their body and then you just start to feel that calmness that connection which can really help that oxytocin to wham bam out of our brain and put the adrenaline and the cortisol in that moment slightly to bed okay so 
We've talked about positioning, we've talked about being calm, our minds, our bodies, and what, how this helps with optimising milk supply is that if we are responding to our baby's needs and their cues, basically on tap, so in a responsive way to them, then that is the best thing that we can do to set up a brilliant milk supply. So when we're pregnant, automatically your body is producing colostrum in your sleep. It's amazing. Just like that, you don't have to do anything about it apart from just be pregnant. Now, when your baby is born, the hormones change and what happens is that then the, um, the system for producing milk turns into something that actually you're in control of. So it works by in a supply and demand basis. So milk has to move out of your breast in order to send a message up to your brain, the, the central office basically up here, to say, right, we're putting in the orders, we need to make some more. And then the office up here sends a message back down to the factories, your boobs, to make the milk. And that happens around the clock, 24 seven, in response to the frequency of your feeds and how effective that milk is being shifted out of your breast. So if we have very sleepy babies um, and they're not feeding very often and we're not stimulating the breast perhaps by either feeding or expressing, then the messages going up to our brain isn't that strong and our brain doesn't think it needs to bother to produce a huge amount of milk. So quite quickly what happens is that the baby's not getting as much milk as they need. They might need topping up perhaps with formula at that point if somebody says you haven't got enough milk and then because the babies are having formula then there's less message going up to the brain to make milk and then we end up in this bit of a spiral of more and more formula and less and less breastfeeding. So that can be avoided very, very, um, well, in most circumstances, basically. So it's actually very, very rare for a mum not to be able to produce enough breast milk for their baby. So some people just, some people just absolutely can't for various reasons, hormonal reasons mainly. Um, but for the vast majority of mums, as long as the right conditions are in place, which is basically moving the milk often enough, then we can set up a full milk supply for our baby. So if you feel that you've got quite a sleepy baby um, and that you're not stimulating the breast very often, then the main thing is to strip the baby off, lots of skin to skin, so we're encouraging them as much as possible um, to get going with their feeds, but also to do some expressing as well. So we're sending those messages up to our brain constantly to, to get that milk supply going. And then also you've then got that express milk to top your baby up rather than having to go to the formula. So it's a kind of win-win situation. Now, if your baby is um, a little bit slow to start putting on weight, then some people do suggest you need to have formula as well as breast milk. Actually, again, the cases where that's really necessary is not that common. Sometimes people are told that formula is richer, is more calorific than breast milk. That's not true. Um, breast milk, um, when it's available, either directly or when you're expressing, is exactly what, what the baby needs. So that's not to say that formula is not necessary sometimes, it absolutely is, but basically a lot less frequently than we're led to believe. Okay, so in terms of how often a baby feeds on average over a 24 hour period, um, we're looking really at at least kind of eight to 12 times. Now, sometimes it might be more than that, and that's really, really normal. Um, and it may be that some feeds are half an hour after the last feed, then it might be an hour and a half, then it might be three hours, then it might be an hour and a half, then it might be two hours. And that randomness is really, really normal at the beginning in the first few weeks, few months. And then things start to settle down. You start to see this flow, this more predictable kind of pattern of feeds coming in. It's a little bit like if we think about how we feed as an adult, if you think about how, what you've done in the last 24 hours and you think, well, okay, I've had a drink at 11 o'clock, then I had another drink at 11.30, then I had a bit of a snack at 12.30, then I had a bigger meal, whenever it was. And actually we, when we think about it, we can drink pretty randomly as well at different times and different amounts and babies are the same. So that's why their feeding pattern 
might be a little bit, well seemingly a little bit all over the place, but actually it's very, very normal. Um, and also some fees might be short and some fees might be long. So some fees might be six or seven minutes, other fees might be 25 minutes or 40 minutes. And again, that's really normal. So if anybody says to you that breastfeed should be at least 15 minutes or at least 25 minutes or something like that, it actually makes no kind of physiological sense because we're all very, very different. Well, our milk all flows at a different rate, our babies suckle at a different rate. We all have um, what's called different breast milk storage capacity. And so with all these factors in place, it means that some babies might only ever need to feed off one boob for seven minutes, let's say for instance, whereas another baby might need to feed for 35 minutes um, using both breasts each time. And both babies might be getting very similar amount of milk. So it's worth, well, it's, it's basically down to kind of experimentation and feeling your way through and what becomes necessary and normal for you. So I always say to, to help you kind of figure that out from the early days is to start feeding on one side and then um, wait until the baby's kind of coming off or falling asleep and just their suckling pattern has stopped doing that nice kind of active drinking where they're jaw is dropping down you can see that they're swallowing milk and so they might come off and then you give them a bit of a wind some people are told you don't need to breastfeed uh, wind a breastfed baby actually you really do so we haven't got we haven't got air in our boobs that's true um, but babies take on wind when they're crying if there's any kind of like ah that kind of thing going on as they're coming to the breast Perhaps if they do have a little bit of a shallow pinchy latch or the milk is very fast or anything like that and they're taking in air through the corners of their mouth, then they're going to need to be winded as well. So it's always worth winding a baby. If he, if he or she brings up wind quite easily, then we pop them back on the same side again. And then next time they're getting sleepy, nothing's really happening and they're coming off, then we could give them another wind and then offer them the second side. So it might be that they don't need it. It might be they're completely conked out and they're really not interested. Or it might be that once they're there and they start smelling the milk, they're showing us those cues again, they start rooting around and they do take some more, which is great. So then sometimes they might only have one side, as I say, sometimes they might have the second. And until you figure out what is normal for you, it's always worth offering them that second, but not panicking if they don't take it. Okay. Now, in terms of dads being involved with all of this um, and partners and whoever else may be around to support you, they have a really important role. So sometimes people feel that they need to be able to give milk in a bottle in order for dad or somebody to be involved. But actually, breastfeeding is the only thing they can't do directly. Um, but they can do everything else. So washing the baby, massaging them um taking them for a walk playing with them rocking them soothing them all of these kinds of things there's so much that that they can do without actually having to be involved in in the feeding directly and also skin to skin skin to skin is such a powerful thing for for partners to do and for babies to calm down and for them to bond so it's not just the um the zone of of a mum for the skin to skin dads absolutely can do that too now when it comes to feeding Dads can be involved in helping you seek out further support if you need it, taking videos of good feeds so that if there's one that's a bit tricky, you can refer back to the video. They can bring you lots of drinks and snacks, have kind of easy grab and go meals ready in the fridge if they're needing to be out for work or something and you're on your own. If you've got sort of grab and go dips and soups and sandwiches and things like that in the fridge, that can really, really help and make a difference. Um, they can, oh, I've got one here, have a little breastfeeding nest, a little basket. So TV remote control, any cream, like hand cream or something, magazine, nappies, breast pads, I've got all sorts of things in here. So it means that you can sit down and you've got all the bits that you need without having to kind of think, oh God, I'm now here and I'm stuck on the sofa and I need X, Y and Z. So that can be a really lovely thing for them to kind of be in control of and do. And also if you're needing to use any equipment, if you're doing any expressing or 
um, you're using any syringes or anything like that for feeding them, they can be involved in the prep of that and keeping them clean and all of that. So it's really vital um, the support that other people can give you actually. And from your point of view, in order to make our lives as full of oxytocin as we possibly can, um, and so that we can feel all this lovely calmness and connection that we want to be able to feel, then trying to take some time out for you is, is really key. Now, I'm, I'm very bad at following my own advice. You know, we have had three babies and I'm still learning, <laughs> but it's really important, even if it's just 10, 15 minutes to get in the bath, walk around the block, um, put your headphones in and listen to a funny podcast, whatever it is, meditate, whatever it is that you do personally to help you relax and help you calm down, try and take that forward into your life with your new baby as well, even if it's just a smidge, because it really can help you to connect with yourself and, and then come back with our babies feeling a little bit calmer than perhaps we were before. Um, but also the other things, is to think about um, your support networks. So obviously at the moment things are a little bit different, but there's so much going on online. So thinking about how you can connect with other people who are in a similar situation as you. Now I've got a free breastfeeding group on Zoom every Tuesday morning. So if you want to come and join me there, then that's a fab place to um, have a chat with other people who are in similar situations, learn from other people's experiences and just kind of, it's a safe space to just kind of come and share really. So that's on Zoom and it's free and it's every Tuesday morning at 10 o'clock. So let me know if you want to come and join. Um, and the other thing people are always asking me, and I'm just mindful of the time now, but I wanted to get this in, is whether you can have a, a drink when you're breastfeeding and you absolutely can. So don't worry about that. The, the caveat is that if you, if you are drinking any alcohol at all, you shouldn't have your baby in bed with you for, for any bed sharing. Um, and obviously we don't wanna be drinking too much. We wanna be essentially having kind of one unit really. Um, if you're starting to go beyond that, then it gets a little bit complex in terms of then thinking, well, how, how soon can I then feed my baby again? But simply, it works a little bit like blood. So if you have one unit of alcohol, it takes about three hours to get into your breast milk and be metabolized and work its way out again. So actually the best time to give your, or to have a small glass of wine or something is when you're feeding, sounds a bit random, but, but then it takes about half an hour to an hour for the levels to peak in your breast milk, by which time your baby stop feeding or coming to the end of their feed. And then you've got the longest possible time for that metabolism can, to happen before your baby is ready uh, to feed again. So you can have a drink, but just be sensible about it basically. If you have, if you're drinking loads, it can actually obviously not be great in terms of being able to look after your baby, but it can have a negative effect on the supply too. So just be, be mindful of that. Um, there's so much else I could say. Now let's just have a uh, look at the questions quickly. Um, yes, about the Zoom meeting. If you get in touch with me, um, my on Facebook or Instagram, Instagram I'm Vanessa underscore the Parent and Baby Clinic. Facebook I'm Vanessa dot the Parent and Baby Clinic. Um, my website is vanessachristie.com. So there's loads of different ways of getting hold of me. And then I will email out each week, depending on when um, you say you want to join, then I'll email out what the details are. Okay, um, so that's that. Um, what can I say? If that's okay, how often would you recommend expressing? How much would you hope to be going to begin with? I'm not sure what that was in um, context of, but to begin, when we're talking about amounts of breast milk um, over a period of time, when a baby first starts breastfeeding, we're talking about really tiny amounts. I've actually got a pebble here. A newborn baby is, has got a pebble sized tummy, which is literally just a teaspoon. So the first milk that a baby has, that colostrum, is not about volume. It's just about, it's often called the baby's first immunization. It's essentially really concentrated breast milk that's packed full of antibodies and all that kind of thing without the water that makes it more dilute. And then very, very quickly actually, over the first week and couple of weeks of a baby's life, their tummy um, gets bigger. So by the time we're looking at a baby who's say three or four weeks old, 
then the amount of breast milk they might be having at a feed may be somewhere between two and four ounces, something like that. Now, the amount of breast milk a baby has from when they're a month old up until when they are six months old is actually really similar. It doesn't keep going more and more and more because otherwise our boobs would be like literally exploding. So it's actually the constituents of the breast milk itself that changes. It's seriously fascinating stuff to meet the needs of the baby, however old they are. So if you look at the side of a formula tin, it goes up, the, the amount a baby needs goes up with their age and their weight. And that's because what's coming out of the tin is the same all the time. So we should never compare how much a formula fed baby is having compared to worrying about how much we're expressing and thinking, ah, we're not, I'm not nearly expressing the amount that, you know, my friend who's giving their baby formula is getting um, because it's not comparable. All right. Um, so I think I better get off here, otherwise I'm going to get in trouble. But thank you so much for joining me. Um, I said at the beginning that if you weren't here, I've got my book, The Baby Feeding Book, which came out in February. It's about all things breastfeeding and bottle feeding and also starting solids as well. So um, it's getting good reviews, which I'm really happy about. Go and take a look at it and um, hopefully you'll find that really useful and reassuring as well. I've got my Zoom group, as I said, every Tuesday morning at 10. And I've also got an antenatal breastfeeding class, which I'm doing different dates, which is two and a half hours. And it's brilliant. And people are finding it really, really super useful. And it's on offer this weekend with the LAH20 code. And so you can find that in various places on the Facebook group. I've posted about it. It's also in the shop kind of under my name. Um, and also if you went directly to my website, you can see it there as well. So thank you so much for joining me and um, take care and really good luck. And I shall be thinking of you all as exciting times for you. Okay, bye.